of the Board of Education of Del Mar Union School District be conducted in person following all current health regulations in effect at the time of the meeting. Item 1.1 is called to order open session. Open session of the November 17th, 2021 Governing Board of Trustees meeting is called to order at 4.45 p.m. Item 1.2, public input concerning items in the closed session agenda. We will now call members of the public who have requested to address the Governing Board regarding items that are on the closed session agenda. Is there any public input concerning the item on the agenda?
The board will now adjourn into closed session at 4.51 p.m. any member of the public may address the board on an item on the agenda or any non-agenda item, but the public must present a written request to the board. Therefore, I ask you to kindly submit your speaker slips at this time to help us run an efficient meeting. Speaker slips for non-agenda items need to be turned in prior to item 4.2, hearing of the public regarding non-agenda items. You will be recognized and called to the podium at that time. You will have three minutes to address the governing board. For those individuals who wish to comment on a particular agenda item, your speaker sub will need to be turned in by item 5.7, hearing of the public regarding agenda items. You'll be recognized and called to the podium when your requested agenda item comes up. You'll have three minutes to address the governing board. Item 3.2 is report of action taken in closed session. First is a report of action from the 10-27-21 uh, board meeting. The board unanimously approved the settlement in the case of Laurel Zitko versus Delmar Union School District et al. San Diego Superior Court case number 37-2019-000-53129 CUNPCTL on October 27, 2021. The district will pay $50,000 in exchange for a full release and dismissal of the lawsuit. A copy of the settlement agreement is available upon request. Item 2.2. In closed session by unanimous vote, the board voted to approve a compromise agreement and release with student in OAH case number 202-106-0286. The agreement includes special education services and attorney's fees in the amount of $28,000 in exchange for a waiver of claims against the district. Items 2.2, 2.4, 2.5, and 2.6. The governing board has determined that the goal of progress as required by employment agreements with the superintendent and assistant superintendent has attendance has been met. And as specified in the employment agreement, the board approved performance compensation for superintendent Holly McClure and assistant superintendents Kathy Burks, Shelley Peterson, and Ryan Stanley, which is items 2.2, 2. Point, sorry, 2.3, 2.4, 2.5, and 2.6 in a 5-0 unanimous vote. Item 3.3 is a Pledge of Allegiance. Holly, will you please lead us? Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um. Uh, item 3.4 is approval of the agenda. Is there a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. The motion to approve the agenda has passed. Item 4.1 is correspondence. Dr. McClure. Good evening. The superintendent's office has received the following correspondence regarding district, district business on these topics. DMUSD health and safety plan, protocols, guidelines, and practices. Face masks in school, student recommendations, 
SDCOE Equity Conference, Student Information, Board Agenda Items, Attachments and Handouts, Del Mar High School Rebuild, Wildfire, Future Budget Envisioning Workshops, and Board Meeting Accommodations. Thank you. Um, item 4.2 is hearing of the public regarding non-agenda items. Are there any? Yes. Okay. Um, we will now call members of the public who have requested to address the governing board regarding items that are not on the agenda. Members of the public who would like to address the governing board regarding a non-agenda item must complete and submit a speaker slip at this time. Okay. So, uh, first we have Kirk Bertita. Oh, it was on. Hold on, can I just turn it on again? There you go. Okay. Go right ahead. Um, I had two items. I wanted to know if there were insights into how things might be proceeding with the upcoming COVID mandates, if there was going to be a policy on that. I know that it seems to be officially voluntary with districts and they're making district-wide choices. Um, if there was an affirmative uh, thought for our district as those come down from, from the government potentially become required. Okay, thank you. So we can't respond right now to public comment, but I can refer you to staff and okay. ask them to follow up with you. So I just hand it over to Dr. McClure your information um, and we'll follow up with you on, right. on your question. Thank you. Can I have a second one? Or no? you can, oh, sorry, yes, please. Yeah. Um, so my second one is in regard to, uh, we were able to participate in the ADL No Place for Hate thing. Uh, when it first came out, we were a little bit apprehensive about some of the tenants that might come through, but ADL historically has been pretty mainstream, pretty middle of the road, and um, at the time that we asked about it, our principal didn't have any information at the beginning of last year. Uh, she invited us to participate, so his parents, my wife and I, were I think the only ones that were allowed to participate. And uh, we were in the meetings with the kids, one or two with the teachers, and we thought it went really, really well. It was uh, it was very much focused on anti-bullying, not some of the more controversial things that you know you see spread around that parents are really worried about. So we were pleasantly surprised, and we gave that feedback to our, our principal at the time. Um, but some of the things that we heard in the teacher meeting, it was all Zoom at the time, so there was 20 or 25 uh, teachers that were on, were, did, did start to cross into some of the more, well, some of the things that made us a little more uncomfortable, some of the intersectionality things, um, some of the things that, that we've all probably seen on the TV. And so I, I wanted to get some thoughts on if there was going to be any affirmative statement on that kind of policy and uh, at, the, at the same time that we had a really positive experience with the No Place for Hate, we contributed some materials, all the things that they talked about with the kids was right on point. I thought it wasn't really anything related to some of the racial stuff, it was really anti-bullying, you know, all of that um, was really, really good. So, um, you know, that, that's sort of my question is where does our district stand on that? And I know there's no, you know, probably no plan for a CRT 101 class or anything like that, but, you know, elements of it did bleed into that meeting that we had with uh, the teachers and, and what they were told. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Laura, Lauren Sherman. Hi, my name is Lauren Sherman. I um, and a parent to a sixth grade Ocean Air student and a third grade Sage Canyon student. And um, we are looking into private schools as possible uh, places for our sixth grader to, to go next year. And I came into complete shock and disappointment when I heard about the board's uh, new policy regarding not allowing for students to receive recommendations from teachers and administrators. There's no communication regarding this change. It came as a shock to me and to uh, every other parent I've talked to. It was done unilaterally without any consideration regarding the negative impact it would have on our district students. Um, 
no reason has been given besides that you want to align with the San Benito School District. Um, I don't understand why we can't just have the administrators and teachers write recommendations for the current students that DMUSD has. San Benito has nothing to do with DMUSD. It has no K through six students. Or even make a universal sheet if it's gonna to be too much time and effort for teachers to write individual recommendations. I think it would be helpful for students to at least be able to have a universal sheet that says yes, I think this student would be a good candidate or no, I don't. Um, this new policy just puts our students at such a disadvantage. Um, private schools require recommendations as part of the application process. This admissions process is extremely competitive. Some grades only have a 15% admission rate and to think that students that don't have recommendations from their teachers or their principals are going to be chosen over someone from the Poway School District who has a recommendation is just naive. I mean, the fact that my son can't have a recommendation from Mr. Stanley, who's known him for six years, is just a disservice to him. Um, I think that parents are gonna really consider um, pulling their students out earlier than sixth grade, because a lot of these private schools have middle schools starting in sixth grade, and it's gonna be easier for them to get in, and it's gonna result in lower enrollment and make our district less desirable, which is not what we want. Um, I really think that this new policy has more disadvantages than advantages. I hope the board will reconsider their policy and think of new options and give the students the ability to compete on an equal playing field than other applicants. Thank you for your time and consideration. Okay, thank you. I'm going to ask uh, Dr. McClure and her staff to follow up with you on that. Okay, um, everyone who's present who wishes to submit a speaker slip will be afforded their time. Those who are not present will not be afforded their time to speak. Um, so I have Marianne Grossner, but um, I, is Marianne Grossner present? Okay, um, then she will move on to our next item. Okay. Um, item 5.1 is board recognition, DMUSD employees of the month, November, December, 2021. Congratulations to the CMUSD Employees of the Month for the months actually of November and December 2021. Dina Irwin, Ashley Falls, speech language pathologist from Carmel Del Mar, Steve Brown, kindergarten teacher, Del Mar Heights, Kathy Minerick, Steam Plus Science Specialist, Del Mar Hills Academy, Blanca Hernandez Stingle, kindergarten Spanish immersion teacher, Ocean Air, Kathy Minerick, she, oh, she was a double. She was both schools. <laughs> Steve, Steve nice. Plus Science Specialist. Congratulations. She gets your certificates? I, she does, actually. <laughs> yes. Sage Canyon School, Paris is Molly, Steam Plus Integration Specialist, Sycamore Ridge, Jennifer Fletcher, Kindergarten Teacher, Tori Hill, Cindy Hofstetter, Sixth Grade Teacher, Early Childhood Development Center, Nicole Sanders, Pre K Lead Teacher, and from the District Office, Rick Rossiter, um, Technology Support Specialist. Please join me in congratulating these excellent employees. <laughs> Okay, 5.2, Board Report of the Del Mar California Teachers Association with President Kevin Cunha. President Halper, members of the board, Dr. Berg and Cabinet, thank you very much for having us this evening once again. I think I said this last time, I'll say it again, these months are going by quickly. It felt like we were here just like a week ago. <laughs> um, I do not have anything from DMCTA to report tonight, but however, it is my pleasure to present my Vice President, Kate Daniel, and also my hero of the evening, um, because as you know, this is conference week, and it was um, a really difficult task to get anybody to really put something together to present tonight, but I promised it, and Kate came through last minute and put something together um, with her first graders and science curriculum at Ocean Air, so I'd like to introduce Kate Daniel. <laughs> Um, I just made a little video to show some of the really fun learning that's happening with our Amplify Science curriculum in first grade. So, we don't get this kind of treat very often these days. So, thanks for taking the time to put that together. That was really, really sweet. My pleasure. All right. Um, 
Sorry, Phoebe. <laughs> I always have to follow the <laughs> <laughs> the, the DMSF report always a tough act to follow. But it's perfect. It's always the perfect segue yeah. to DMSF. Yes. Mm -hmm. So thank you. They were adorable. And that, what a great lesson, too. So yeah, good evening, um, President Halbrin, members of the board, Dr. McClary, and members of the cabinet. It's good to see all of you. Um, we just wanted to start from DMSCF by thanking our incredible com um, community. We um, have wrapped up our fall campaign and we just wanted to share, which we got to see a little, uh, you know, a little video of right now, of just how in the incredible learning that's happening in our STEAM Plus classes right now. And we're just grateful to our STEAM Plus teachers and to all of our teachers and to our community for all of their support of STEAM Plus. And so we do have some pictures just to show of all of our kids getting to engage in all of their different classes and we're so thrilled to have music back in person this year and all of the the great steam learning that, that's happening so thank you um, to everybody um, and the next slide is just a, a, a kind of reminder for this group we will we are um, currently recruiting for DMSCF um, we are looking for new candidates for directors for now, but definitely for next year, we do have um, a number of sixth grader um, parents on our board who have loved every minute of being on DMSEF, but will um, you know no longer be here next year, myself included. Um, so we want to make sure we have a great board in place. So um, we are just kind of spreading the word and making sure um, we have another um, great board for for next year as well. Um, and we are thrilled to announce that we have a sixth grade legacy tree program that's now um, running district wide. Um, it was launched at all of our schools this past week. Um, certain schools already have this in place and it's just a great um, memento for families to have that have been able to contribute to DMSCF and support STEAM Plus and they get to have um, a you know nice leaf that's engraved with their family name or their student's name. And I believe this might be the one that's at Ocean Air, but we have um, three installed right now, and by the end of this year, we'll have them at all of the schools, which I think will be fantastic and a great legacy for all of our sixth graders and um, all of our families to come to. So um, we just wanted to share that with all of you. And then just a reminder to save the date. We have our Jan January 20th STEAM Plus event coming up, which um, will be an adult event and it, um, it will be in the evening here in this room with the district and we're really looking forward to having families and parents gather together to talk about our incredible STEAM Plus program and the future of, of the program as well. And then we have our um, Jogathon dates of January 30th and February 18th. Um, we'll probably be here before we know it, so. <laughs> um, so just a reminder to look forward to those. We can't wait for those principal challenges and all of the fun to be had for, um, for our job fun. Uh, so thank you very much, and happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving to you. Um, thank you. Uh, 5.4 is a board report from the Delmar Parent Teacher Association. Uh, we have Tori Hills School PTA President Mindy Lewis to provide a report to the board regarding the PTA and giving. Hi. Good evening, President Helmer and members of the board and Dr. McClary and members of the cabinet. I'm Mindy Lewis. I am the proud president of the Tory Hills PTA. And tonight I wanted to share a little bit about how our PTAs are giving, kind of in the holiday spirit, um, and some of the different things. So I do it on my own. Okay. It's been a while for me since I've done a presentation. <laughs> so um, the mission of the California PTAs is to positively impact the lives of all children and families. And our PTAs at our eight schools do it in so many different ways. And one of the ways is through giving. So I'm going to highlight three of the ways that I see our PTAs giving. One of them is giving their time. Um, I refer to PTAs as an army of volunteers. Anything that you need done on a campus, you can get parents to come and do it and they will come in numbers. Uh, they give their time planning and supporting so many community events. Here's a picture from Sycamore Ridge's movie night they got to have last week, which was very well attended and fun. Um, they come and decorate the school, whether it's the first day of school, whether it's promotion, Red Ribbon Week, they're always there. They spend their time fundraising and even get their hands dirty. I know a lot of the parents have taken over the school community garden. Um, another thing they do is give resources, 
whether it's classroom mini grants to fund the different needs of the teachers. They've also given their resources for school assemblies. This is a picture, I think it was just from Monday of Sage Canyon's BMX assembly that they got to have on campus. Um, and they support so many of the different programs and clubs on campus. And there's a picture from Carmel Hall Marsh Road uh, earlier, I don't know. But another way that PTAs do give is by giving back. And I have been blown away with the way that all eight of our PTAs in this district have made giving such a priority and they have really found different ways to involve the students in giving back to the community as well. So I wanna highlight some of the different ways that our schools and PTAs have worked together to give back. So one of them just happened right after Halloween with Operation Gratitude. A lot of the schools um, were part of this and Ocean Air alone reported to me that they collected 420 pounds of candy that were then donated to um, the military. I actually took this picture. I drove 250 pounds of candy myself to Camp Pendleton <laughs> and handed it off to some very happy Marines. Um, so that was just a really awesome experience because we're excited to give their candy back. Um, another one is the, things, the Giving Things Initiative Delmar Hills and Delmar Heights have put together. They um, have the students create thank you cards and then personally deliver them to different essential workers around the community, which is a really neat thing. Um, and then the Monarch School, Tory Hills has supported the Monarch School every year. Um, they have the students create hygiene kits for the students at the, minor, the, the Monarch School. They put full-size bottles of shampoo, conditioner, and other essential needs. They write uplifting cards and then we combine them and deliver them to the Monarch School. Um, and then also right now, there's a lot of drives going on on the campuses for the Community Resource Center holiday baskets. Sigmore Ridge just collected 139 coloring books and Sage Canyon is collecting different puzzles and games um, to go in their holiday baskets. And then the really cool thing that I thought I wanted to share is that a lot of the PTAs have combined different community events they're doing with a giving element. So Delmar Hills and Delmar Heights during their ice cream social at the beginning of the year had a backpack drive where people could bring um, new or used backpacks to give back them. A lot of the readathons included an element with a used book collection. Ashley Falls just had their food through where they did a food drive um, to give non-perishables to the new nonprofit 9213 Cares. Um, there's gonna be a, field, a family field day with a toy drive. So there's so many exciting things going on on the campuses and um, our PTAs are gonna to continue to give and make a positive impact on our community. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Let's put all those slides together. Okay, we're at 5.5 board reports of governing board members. So we'll start, I have an order here, but I think we just start at the end. Catherine, do you wanna? Sure. Start there? Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming tonight. Um, I was able to complete, I'm really thankful, I was able to complete my um, final master's in governance for the California School Board Association um, series. It was on community relations and advocacy. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, and I learned so much in, in this whole, there were five sessions and I learned just a lot about how to be a better school board uh, trustee and this in particular, this last session tied in well with um, the other activity I participated in this month, um, which was the budget workshop, the visions and goals workshop for our district. Um, so I'm really excited about all that's to come this school year and in the years ahead with you know, connecting with community members to make sure that our community is actively engaged in um, the next steps that our district is taking. So yeah, that's great. Congratulations on graduating. <laughs> so uh, I attended the um, uh, DMSEF uh, board meeting, and uh, I don't have anything to add to what Phoebe had just said. They were working very well in the fundraising. I think you said something about this is the highest amount you've had this early so far yeah. uh, in the meeting. So that was that was nice to nice to hear. They've been doing a great job over there. So I was glad to be part of that. Thanks. And uh, I, along with all of my colleagues, learned a lot about the budgets. Uh, we had our workshop and uh, kind of a primer, I guess, for those of us that have gone through um, 
of the masters in governance. Uh, we, we kind of understand how budgets work, but to always have a, a kind of a primer on that, and I, I appreciate Mark and, and Kat putting that together. It was uh, well put together and informative. Thank you very much. And, um, I know I'm looking forward to the California School Boards Association's annual meeting, which is coming up in a couple of weeks. And there's always uh, programs that are that are helpful for us as we venture through this um, and enter the new year. Uh, I wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving. And uh, I can't believe I'm wishing everybody a happy Thanksgiving already. <laughs> Really, I uh, appreciate all the work that the, the PTAs are doing out there. Um, it's uh, it's really nice to see the community being involved, and I was able to go to the Ashley Falls booth through and uh, was able to walk around, see family members and kids, and it was really nice just to see the community be alive again. Um, I was also at a uh, San Diego County uh, School Boards Association meeting, and was, we were meeting with uh, the president of uh, CSBA, uh, Susan Heredia, and uh, she came down just to be able to introduce herself and kind of share some thoughts and how things are going and uh, um, it was a good good opportunity to kind of speak with her so um, nothing too earth shattering but that's pretty much it for me but yeah uh, happy Thanksgiving everybody and hope you all have a good time for everything you will be with your families and everything thank you I agree it's so great to have families going back on campuses for these events it's like feels like it's been a million years but it's actually only been a year and a half so um, things are looking up um, and I also enjoyed the budget workshop, and I echo the thanks that Doug offered to Mark and Kathy for all the work putting that together. It's a great um, primer for us, but it's also just a great foundation as we go into this next stretch, which will be strategic planning, getting ready for the next three-year strategic plan that our district will put together in the spring. Um, okay, so 5.6 is the board report. Superintendent, Jeff Lover. Good evening again, and thank you, Kate, for sharing tonight. It was great, and it's, I mean, I've had the pleasure of being able to see you with your kids in class and everything else going on at your school and throughout the district, and thank you, and it is a busy week, and thank you, and thank you to all of our other teachers for all that you're doing for parent conferences. We really appreciate it, and I know all of our parents appreciate the time that goes into planning and preparing for conferences and making it such a valuable um, experience for parents to really learn more about their child. So thank you so much. So, so much goes into that. And Mindy, uh, so much giving and I appreciate all that our PTAs do and on behalf of everybody, please send back to the PTAs our gratitude for all of the volunteer service that you do and the leadership you provide at all of our, at our schools. It's been um, a wonderful start to the school year and so much uh, good is going to happen throughout the rest of the school year. So we, we are focused, as has been brought up, on continuing our return to normal. And you saw some examples of that already this evening. We are you know, excited to be able to bring back some of the things that our kids have been missing because although we have been in school, we were in school all last year, we've been in school all this year, we do realize that there are things that our kids have missed out on and things that they're still missing out on. And so to be able to make good decisions and move forward with, um, with bringing some of those things back is actually doing what's right and best for our children. So we saw a, couple, a picture of an assembly that happened just this last week. So to be bringing back assemblies and be planning field trips and things that make the whole experience as rich and meaningful as possible for all of our kids is very exciting. So we're, we're thrilled about that and as we move through the next coming, you know, the next months, we're also anxious and excited to be able to um, be welcoming back more parents on campus as we as we move into um, hopefully after the holidays and we know how, how important that is and what a, an important part of our culture all of our parents are so we're excited about that as well so and a huge happy Thanksgiving to everybody from all of us it's been a wonderful start to the school year we're very proud of everything going on throughout our entire district and appreciate our board support as well in, in all of our work so thank you and I want to say a big thank you to every staff member who works in this district for doing outstanding work on behalf of our children every day and for caring so much about kids so thank you thank you and we're at 5.7 here a hearing of the public regarding agenda items 
For anyone who would like to address the governing board on a particular agenda item, your speaker is slip will need to be turned in at this time. You'll be recognized to call to the podium when your request of agenda item comes up. You'll have three minutes to address the governing board. 5.8, board approval of minutes, read October 27th, 2021, and November 9th, 2021 meetings. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? Or any changes? I'll move to approve minutes. Is there a second? Okay. Okay, into Catherine. So, Catherine, um, and uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. The motion to approve the minutes is passed. Consent agenda. Are there any questions or items on the consent agenda? Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? agenda? I move to approve the consent agenda. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 As opposed? Motion to approve the consent agenda passed. So we are item 7.1, board report, history, uh, social science framework, civic learning and engagement. And I'll just mention that you may know that there's a binder in the back of the room. So just like we have a packet of materials here in our binder that we received, in our folder that we received when we came into the meeting, um, there's also a, uh, the same set of materials in the binder in the back of the room that you're welcome to have a look at or let staff know if you'd like a copy. Um, and then also the recording of this meeting together with the visuals of the meeting will be available on our website uh, subsequent to the meeting. So look for that. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah, Sarah Oscar, our coordinator of our building and instruction meeting. Thank you. Good evening, President Halpern and members of the board. It is a pleasure to be with you this evening on behalf of our uh, instructional services department and district staff to share an overview of civic literacy instruction in Del Mar Union School District. When working with groups of parents, teachers, and administrators throughout the country, Ron Richard, a senior research associate with Harvard Project Zero, and a consultant with our district, will often ask the question, what do we want our children to be like as adults? Interestingly enough, Ron has found that regardless of where this question is asked, the responses are very similar. There is often an emphasis on the attributes that drive learning, like curiosity and questioning, and those that facilitate innovation, like creativity, problem solving, and risk taking. There's also a focus on the skills that are needed to work with others and to manage complexity, such as empathy, collaboration, and critical thinking. These intellectual virtues establish a vision for what a quality education can afford, and also for what excuse me, and also paints a picture of what it looks like to be a well-rounded citizen. We value the role that our children play as citizens in our classrooms, schools, and our community, and we work to facilitate opportunities for them to practice the skills and dispositions of citizenship that will grow with them over a lifetime. In 2016, the California History Social Science Framework was updated to include civic literacy standards. The goal of these standards was to support our students with making connections between historical and modern day events, developing research skills, and gathering and synthesizing information with the ultimate goal of supporting students with presenting logical arguments based on evidence. These revised standards empower our students to realize their individual and collective impact as citizens within their communities. This year, our STEAM Plus integration specialists are collaborating closely with our grade level classroom teachers to design meaningful grade level specific units of study that incorporate the design thinking process with civic standards that are outlined within our California History Social Science Framework and our Roadmap to Educating for American Democracy. Students engage in experiential civic learning experiences which allow them to take ownership over their individual, or excuse me, take ownership over and um, identifying community needs and addressing those needs. The themes for our units are inspired by Harvard's Project Zero, um, their specific project around children are citizens and aligned with grade level units of study. You can see all of our themes for the grade levels here. 
So now let's take a look at what some of these civic learning experiences look like in action for a few of our grade levels. As citizens of Del Mar, our second grade citizens visited Crest Canyon. They made observations about living organisms and their needs, and they are designing ways to keep the canyons and waterways clean, to preserve our natural habitats, and they will eventually present their solutions to Canyon Lands and San Diego Groundworks. At another school site, our second graders are working on a two-part project that begins with students learning about their family ancestry and creating a Tree of Me project to depict their individual family stories. The second part of this project will, um, will incite a design thinking challenge to create a Tree of Us, which is a shared representation of the ancestral history of the class and will invite others in the school and the community to participate in the project by sharing their story. After learning about traditional Kumeyaay culture, our third grade citizens of San Diego interviewed a current member of Kumeyaay Nation, Ms. Orozco, and learned more and learned more about what is important to the modern day Kumeyaay. Our students are designing and creating statues, movies, and creating native plant gardens to honor the Kumeyaay and present back to Ms. Orozco. Through civic learning experiences, our students become change makers, practicing the skills and dispositions of citizenship that will last a lifetime. We look forward to you visiting our classrooms throughout the school year and seeing our civic learning in action. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I see that you're, these are at uh, different sites. Are we able to you, utilize these lessons at all the sites? Yes, that is one of the things we're putting together. Our integration specialists, we have a uh, STEAM Plus internal hub that shares all of these experiences commonly so that they can really um, incorporate some of these meaningful experiences working with industry experts and the thinking behind some of these projects with each other. Yes. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we can't wait to get in the classrooms one of these days and see that in action. <laughs> We've seen some debates and things like that in the past, past years. So hopefully we'll get to see that again one soon. Okay, 7.2 is a student report, stu um, social media, and student well-being by Jenny Hutt, Executive Director of Student Services. Good evening. Thank you. It is my pleasure to be here to talk to you and present this tonight about this very important topic of social media and the impact that it has had on our students and their well-being. And um, I think that we are all recognized that there has been an increase in dependence on electronics and technology over the past decade. But certainly as a result of the pandemic, we've seen really even a more an exponential increase in dependence on social media platforms as a means to connect virtually with others. And recently, we've learned the impact more. There's been more data and more information come out publicly about the impact that that reliance on social media and the isolation of the pandemic has been has had on our collective well-being and certainly on our students and our families and our community. So we will be talking, I'll be sharing with you tonight um, some of the data around mental health in general and how that data really has informed our development of priority actions for our district. What are we doing around this topic to really raise awareness and support our families um, understanding the critical value of human connection and um, our next steps in bringing this awareness to our district. So it's important that we consider the mental health data when we are talking about our priority actions for the district around this very important topic. Prior to 2012, research has shown that geriatrics were the loneliest demographic of citizens in North America. Since 2012, that demographic, that research has shown that the demographic has shifted, and it's actually young people, age 16 to 24, 
that have been rated the loneliest demographic. So research shows that people with more online friends or online only friends report um, on social media report a higher degree of loneliness. So this isolation of the pandemic and the increased dependence on digital platforms have only exacerbated this problem. So like I said, it's really important that we're considering the mental health, the data around mental health and the impact that it's had on our young people. This past October, 2021, the American Academy of Pediatrics and the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, as well as the Children's Hospital Association, announced that the mental health of our children has become a national emergency. And they're citing the serious toll that the pandemic has played on top of existing challenges. So it's important for us to think about if social media is really a way for us to connect to one, one another, why are we seeing these statistics? Why are we seeing a rise in the reports of the number of um, higher rates of depression and anxiety and even isolation and disconnection, even though the social media platforms are being used as a means for people to connect. So what does this mean for us as a district? We really look at this data and it has informed us in our development of these priority actions. And we're really basing this around our core beliefs of the importance of human connection. So one of our priority actions is analyze the impact on students living in an increasingly present virtual world. Explore the importance of human to human connection and the value of caring and concern for others as human beings who have feelings and needs. And the other priority action, develop a systemic approach to support students in fourth, fifth, and sixth grade in understanding the role of social media in their lives. And these priority actions, they are based on some of the data that we've received, but they also really speak to our core values as a district and our core beliefs of the importance of human connection and human relationships. And this, this also is in alignment with really what was driving our emphasis to be back to school last year and to keep our schools open, is really understanding the importance of this human connection for our students and their families and our community as a whole. So what are we doing here in DMUSD to support this work? We have been holding ongoing conversations with our leadership team around really raising awareness to this topic, the importance of um, our human connection within our community, but also raising awareness of the impact that this um, reliance on social media has had on our students and helping guide conversations around how to um, support our students and families as they navigate this digital world and experience. So we recognize the increase and in role that our school counselors continue to have on supporting our students, um, their well-being, their mental health well-being, and also their social emotional development through the second step curriculum, through the lessons that are provided in the classroom by our teachers, our lessons um, provided through Common Sense Media that address the topic of digital citizenship, and then also our Parent Speaker Series, which this year will be focused around this topic of social media and the impact that it has on our students and also helping maintain the well-being of our students. So our next steps, we will, in December, we'll be screening a film. It's an, indie, an independent documentary called Upstanders. It is a, a very powerful film. Um, we have watched, we've had a screening of it ourselves and it's very powerful. It sends a very valuable message on social media. They talk somewhat about how it impacts um, the scientific impact that it has on, on um, anyone who uses it as far as um, what drives us to continue to seek the, the feedback through social media. And um, it is a powerful message of building resiliency in our students 
and we are engaging staff and school communities to raise awareness around this topic. So we will be um, organizing screenings at each school site to really allow communities, school communities to come together and engage in these conversations to raise awareness on this topic, but also to provide support for our families as they guide children through this digital world that they have been born into. <laughs> Um, and then in February, we have a speaker, Julia Storm. She will be presenting on the topic of helping parents raise self, safe, conscious, and healthy kids in the digital age. And that will be a district event. She will be here in um, one evening in February. And then we will continue preparing and planning to bring this topic directly to our students as part of our priority action through student assemblies in the spring. So this is the, um, the poster for the Upstanders film. And like I said, it is a documentary about the power of connection and talks quite a bit about um, social media and the impact. And these are the dates and the times that we will be showing the film at each school site. We're sending out a postcard to parents so they will have information directly around um, when the film will be shown at their school site. And we're encouraging all parents to attend at their school to really engage in conversation around the importance of this topic, not only to our students, but really to us as a society and recognizing the role that the district plays in, in supporting this need for our students and our families and really bringing it back to the power of the connection, the human connection and the value of that. Thank you for being so proactive on this important topic. I really appreciate that. And I'm looking forward to seeing the film, so thank you. It's excellent. <laughs> Questions or comments? No, I just want to say thanks. Uh, thanks for this. It's really important, especially uh, what's happened over the last couple of years in the social, emotional, uh, and social media, all of that uh, put together. So uh, I, I know we're going to be in a review on this. I'd like to see more money. We have that block grant we're going to talk about later, but I'd like to see more go into this type of education for the teachers and the staff. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Jane. Thank you for your presentation. I think this is yeah, definitely like Bill Scott's comments. I think this is an important asset to focus on. Um, I did have one question. I noticed that there's a uh, supporting fourth, fifth, and sixth grade students. I was wondering, um, is, is there a reason why you picked up starting in fourth grade? Uh, regards to social media is why it doesn't go younger um, you because know, I've, I've seen you know kids starting you know whether it's games whether it's whatever they, they're interacting with other people mm -hmm. um, earlier than they fourth grade. and uh, those were the those are the grade levels that we have focused on for the priority action but as we are planning for our student assemblies in the spring we will be considering conversations with our younger students as well so uh, I do believe that we are seeing an increase in social media use with younger and younger students. Um, and so like I said, for our student assemblies, we will be addressing some of those topics and also our classroom activities provided by Common Sense Media through the Digital Citizenship, those are provided at all of our grade levels. Just to kind of follow up with that, do you, what, how, uh, what is the digital citizenship taught? Is it uh, kind of like lessons in each individual class or? Yes, and it is scaled and directed towards the developmental age of the classroom. So it, depending on the grade level, it is uh, around topics of digital safety, a digital footprint, um, just those topics um, throughout the year. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. 8.1 and Border View of Educator Effectiveness Block Grant Expenditure Plan with Shelley Peterson, Assistant Superintendent of Instructional Services. Good evening. Um, so this block grant provides one-time funding to be used on professional learning uh, to promote educator equity, quality, and effectiveness. This grant can be expended over five, a five-year period, beginning with the 21-22 school year and concluding with the 25-26 school year. And I believe you all have the expenditure plan in front of you. So this 
So it's presented this evening with hopes that it will be approved at the December board meeting. Is, uh, I had some uh, questions. Is it possible to, I know you've got a lot in the last year, so I don't really like to have it. I like to be able to spend it earlier and save the money because you never know we'll have the budget, so I did it. Can we pull some of it earlier or not? We can. We could spend it concentrated in because, next year, the following because year. Because I, I mean, I think stuff we're already doing, uh, mm -hmm. so it's just a matter of what level we're pulling the money out of. So if we can say we, we got it, this pull the money out of it sooner is what I would like to see. I'd also like to, as, as I, as in Jenny's talk, more money going into some of the social emotional, more money going into, the, you know, educational standards like the, the skills that matter most by Ron Richard, uh, 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 um, uh, those types of skills uh, or the training, that's where I'd like to see it, uh, it, it as opposed to some of the other programs that are in there, but really uh, focus on educational learning, uh, getting students at the highest level they can get, and uh, social emotional and mental health issues. So and okay. I think that's where I, I'd like, really like to see it. So. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, this is just a report. It sounds like we're going to be voting on this at the next meeting. Okay. 8.2 is board approval to hold the 2021 organizational meeting of the Governing Board of Trustees on December 15th. This is the action item. So, Um, is there a motion to approve the date for the 2021 organizational meeting of the Governing Board of Trustees of December 15th? I'll move to approve the date. Second. Um, all those of you? Aye. Aye. None. So the meeting date has been set for December 15th. 8.3 is board review. First reading of the proposed 2022 Governing Board of Trustees meeting dates and locations. <coughs> Good evening, this is the first reading of the proposed meeting dates for the 2022 um, calendar year, and you can find them attached to this item. Free review, and it will come back next month for approval. Okay, 8.4 is board report universal transitional kindergarten and community funded districts. We have Dr. McClure and superintendent, and we have first assistant superintendents, this is services. This evening, uh, Dr. McClure and I will be presenting on the Universal Transitional Kindergarten and Community Funded School Districts. Uh, in this presentation, we'll um, be looking at uh, legislation, legislation as well as uh, what would Universal Transitional Kindergarten uh, cost in DMUSD and uh, what are the actions that DMUSD is taking. So um, AB uh, 130, which was the Education Budget Trailer Bill, uh, in, uh, it had the implementation of a universal transitional kindergarten, which would create a 14th grade level. Uh, in addition, uh, community-funded school districts, including uh, Del Mar, do not receive an apportionment for TK. Um, this may look familiar to you. This is what was presented at the budget workshop. And what is the cost for a, a universal transitional kindergarten for Del Mar? Um, I'm making the assumptions that uh, we would have approximately 500 students uh, with uh, 20 students to two adults, uh, looking at possibly you know one adult being a certificated teacher, the other adult a classified, substitute costs, materials and supplies, uh, we're looking at a, a cost of approximately a 4.7 million. Some of the items that we haven't uh, quantified yet is the curriculum for uh, TK, STEAM Plus, professional learning, uh, universal meals, and also facilities and equipment. Uh, 
that calls for a reconfiguration of classrooms to include bathrooms, classroom furniture, lunch tables, playground equipment, technology for the classroom, for the teacher, for the student, and related software, and also uh, the analysis of capacity at school sites and whether modular buildings would need to be included. Um, we know that our uh, goal is to remove the relocatable, relocatable classrooms and convert to um, you know, um, permanent buildings. Uh, we also know that uh, currently we're looking at $800 a square foot for new construction, and the size, the average size of a uh, TK class is about 1,250 uh, square feet, so that's about a million dollars per classroom. So it is a considerable cost to, to build additional classrooms for a TK program. But also we know that we have some shifting and, and changing going on in our um, district as we are removing approximately 20 relocatable classrooms and building 20 uh, in, uh, classrooms in uh, Pacific Cottage Ranch. We have that shift going on there. So Transistor Kindergarten is a um, Transitional kindergarten is something that we're doing uh, a great deal of advocacy around right now because it has, as Kathy was, said, was saying, been a result of leg the legislation, which is why it is being offered at districts in the state of California who do receive apportionment. So for those districts, they are receiving funding per student for those children attending transitional kindergarten. We are not eligible to receive funding, and we do not receive funding for transitional kindergarten. So we are uh, communicating and advocating with our with our state legislators. We're meeting individually with each legislature, legislator, as well as working as a collective with other community-funded districts, the superintendents and staff um, from those districts to advocate for funding for all students um, to uh, be able to attend transitional kindergarten in the state of California in an, at an adequate level. That includes not just the ADA funding, but also funding for facilities. Because as you heard Kathy just share, there's a significant cost to facilities, and we do not have the facilities to um, add transitional kindergarten at this time. A second very important piece about, why, about transitional kindergarten and why we're doing such heavy advocacy is because offering such a program would be an insurmountable financial burden on, our, on the K-6 community funded district. If, if you think about that, a 14th grade, we currently have K through 12, so adding on a 14th grade in our situation would be absorbed solely by our elementary school district. So we would take on that entire financial burden and a district of middle school and high school districts such as San Diego would feel none of that burden. So it is insurmountable when you think about the cost and what it would take to implement a transitional kindergarten program absent of adequate funding. It would be a huge increase in staffing and I will say because adding, um, adding that program, we would need to add the teachers that, that Kathy was talking about as well as the aides that Kathy was talking about. It, that is a, a, a huge cost to the district. I've already talked about facilities and, and the fact that we don't have those facilities. So when we look at what, what so what would happen, adding TK students you know, into our current funding would reduce resources and eliminate programs and priorities that we currently have for our K-6 students. So when we talk about huge increase in staffing for TK, there would need to be a decrease in staffing somewhere else. So that decrease in staffing would come from somewhere like a, a dramatic um, change and elimination of certain programs such as STEAM Plus or class size. So that is why it is so important to us that we're advocating for funding for all districts, including all students, including those students who attend school in a community funded district. Right now, we do not receive funding for TK, and um, which is why we don't offer TK. It is related to apportionment and we do not receive funding and we're not eligible to receive funding now or in the future without a change in leg legislation. And the 
funding and, and that advocacy is happening now. We are we are having meetings and having those conversations and communicating with our California legislators now. Thank you for this presentation and it's an important issue that every parent community member should care about in this district and any other community member in the district. And so um, it's definitely important to advocate for for the funding from the state um, to the extent this is mandated. And um, just wanted to ask if there are ways that we could let the community know that they can help in this advocacy effort with the state. Yes, as we move forward and we're um, working collectively with, as, as I was saying, other community funded districts, we'll have uh, a specific way for community members to reach out to our legislators. We're doing that now so as to uh, raise awareness and um, advocate for our legislators to actually um, create a funding mechanism for us and we will communicate that to our um, parents as well and community members as well. Thanks, Holly. Uh, uh, one thing uh, I know that came out of the, uh, uh, in the budget uh, workshop that we had in the playground equipment, those are what we have playground equipment, uh, but ours is rated for five to seven year olds, and you would need four to six or something like that, is what my, was my understanding. So you have to replace or add playground equipment. You know, the classrooms, well, we do have spare classrooms, but they don't have bathrooms, they're not the right size. So things like that, that, that would drastically impact uh, uh, our ability to run a TK program. We would have to put some construction into classrooms, add bathrooms, uh, add playground facilities, and uh, as in addition to all the lunch tables and classroom uh, uh, furniture and all that stuff that, you, that would go along with it. So it, it is a big uh, capital intensive program to bring it in, as well as the loss of whatever programs because we, we would have a hard decision as a board as to where to find, where to pull the funding from because we don't get any more money if this, the state does not change this. We would not get any more money towards the DK program. It has to come from somewhere. And that would mean it has to come from K-6 programs that we currently have. So as Holly said, small class sizes, uh, <coughs> steam bus programs, or language program, <coughs> things like that that uh, we necessarily <coughs> really want so please we need advocacy from the parents to really uh, uh, tell the legislators they need to fund this if they're going to mandate it so that's it so. i know we touched on this in the budget workshop we had um, from a few sorry, weeks ago um but could we get more concrete numbers as to the amount of classrooms we currently have Bathrooms to accommodate TK students and what sites they're at. So we know how many classrooms we would need to retrofit with bathrooms if that's possible, or build new classrooms if that's also required. Mm -hmm. Yes, we're working on that. Yes, yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. And then, um, just to be clear, it's a certificated teacher along with a classified um, aid. That's correct. For, so that's the two. <coughs> that okay, other questions or comments? Thank you, you'll keep us posted and let us know what we can do and let the community know. Yes, we will. I'll be supportive. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay, 9.1 Sport Report Facilities Update with Estelle Hunting, Executive Director of Capital Programs and Control. facilities update and this month we will cover our Delmar Hills Academy modernization, the Pacific Sky School uh, build and Delmar High School rebuild. The Delmar Hills Academy modernization, uh, as you know, we've conducted our three community planning sessions and at this point we are continuing to do some work on our exterior options and our classroom layouts. 
the uh, architectural and the engineers at my office have been doing uh, the more in-depth structural analysis, looking at things like the, uh, the exterior uh, panels and do we need to replace, do we need to, uh, where can we put in windows, things like that that will help us to, to come to some full understanding and what we actually can do to add uh, light into those classrooms and to make some of those adjustments. So we anticipate having the information needed to come back and do a more uh, in-depth report to the board next month and bring our architects from line office. So um, our plan would be to come back and have a little more information on the exterior options we're looking at, classroom layouts, and go into a little more detail. With the Civic Sky School, uh, we I presented to the Carmel Valley Planning Board uh, just after the board, actually the day after last month's board meeting, and the planning board did approve our request for stop signs and crosswalks. Um, appreciate uh, Board Member Mock for being there and uh, speaking in favor. Uh, we are now working with the Carmel Valley Planning Board and Councilmember Lacava's office. There's sort of a step planning board that they put through to the city, and then uh, Councilmember Lacava's office, Ricky Clay High, with his office, was at that meeting and has asked a couple of questions. So they're uh, taking an interest, and so we'll be moving forward. Uh, we know the speed at which the city sometimes works, so we're going to be pushing on it now so we can hopefully have those installed prior to the school opening in August. And we continue uh, ongoing construction. We are uh, continue to make great progress with our anticipated start date in August and full completion in January. And we're hoping that we can move that full completion up a little bit earlier so that our kitchen gets done a little bit earlier after school programs. Uh, and I think that we absolutely will be able to beat that date at this point. Uh, when we look at the site now, we're all the way down to uh, roofing in more closer to the admin building. This is uh, the, the, the front of the school and the kindergarten, which is getting close. Uh, we're looking at the masonry, which is all that block being done probably in, substantially done in about three weeks. So uh, really amazing. Uh, you'll see a lot of, we, we've got the electrical and data and power, all that stuff is, is pretty much roughed in. And we now actually have a parking lot. So uh, a nice thing for the community as well, because a lot of the, we, we have a lot of people on that site. We have over 100 people at that site some days and being able to bring a lot of that parking off of the street. Uh, the city work has been done, so it's kind of been able to move a little bit off the street, um, a little bit less impact to the community too, which is nice. Great progress being made, so. And then with the Delmar High School rebuild, uh, we had uh, unanimous approval from the Planning Commission. Uh, that approval was appealed by Procopio on behalf of Save the Field, and so the appeal then leads to uh, moving to city council. So city council will adhere and make a final determination. We are working diligently with the city staff. Uh, we are, uh, unfortunately, the city staff has to update a report and submit that report. So we're working on getting that so that they can get that in as quickly as possible so we can hopefully get that city council hearing uh, next month. As soon as we're aware of the city council hearing date, we will be sharing that out as we did with the planning commission date. And upon receipt of the permits, uh, we'll update the construction timelines so and we can move forward with construction of that project. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Any questions? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, item 12.1 is board review, reminder of upcoming DMUSD events. And 12.2. Um, Liberty Act is for the December regular board meeting. It's 12.2. 12. 12. Um, are there any items? Okay, then we're at 12.3, adjournment of the meeting. Is there a motion to adjourn the meeting? Is there a second? I'll second. <laughs> Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Meetings adjourned. Have a good evening.